As we move into our message this morning, I'm wondering, how do you feel about sushi? <laughs> you know, I love it. I see some thumbs up. I know it can be a polarizing topic, but I, I remember the first time I had sushi. It was back in about fourth or fifth grade. It was with my grandmother, who we call Pama. And every birthday, Pama would take my sisters out to go shopping for their birthday. But fortunately for me, she didn't take me shopping. She let me pick another activity that we got to do. And that year, I knew we were going to go bowling. Like, I really was excited to go bowling. And she this time allowed me to invite a friend. And so I invited Tony Moore. And not only did I get to pick what we would do, I also got to pick where we'd go to lunch. And so I was talking with Tony about this, and somehow he convinced me to ask if we could go for sushi. And so I don't remember exactly how Pamela responded when I made the request. All I know is that she did ultimately let us go get sushi, and it changed my life. <laughs> no, actually, I really I don't remember the sushi at all, because the sushi wasn't the point, was it? Right? The, the sushi wasn't the gift. The bowling wasn't the gift. Right? I didn't really fully understand the gift at the time, but the gift was the time with Pama herself. Right? Sometimes we can misunderstand gifts. We can misunderstand their purpose, their real meaning, the real function in our lives. And I think this is so important this morning as we're getting into the topic of spiritual gifts. We want to keep this in mind. This is the next message in our series that we've been in for a couple weeks now called Go and Serve Together, that over the course of these weeks, we're leaning into Jesus' commission for the church, that it particularly was captured in John chapter 20, verse 21, where Jesus told his disciples, as the Father has sent me, so also I am sending you. We are reflecting on how God is ascending God. He sent his word out at creation and made all things. He sent his son ultimately to come and bring salvation. And he sends us, his church, out to continue the work that Jesus began to bring healing and redemption to all of the broken places in the world where sin has caused devastation and destruction. He's doing this work, restoring all things, and right now it's through the church. And so we're focusing in this series on how God sends us and how he equips us to continue the work that Jesus came and started. And so today, we're looking at how God equips us, particularly with the gifts of the Spirit as we go and serve. And so we're going to look at this through 1 Corinthians chapter 12. If you want, you can follow along on the screen. But let's listen for God's Word speaking to us this morning. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between Spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues and still and to still another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. And let's pray as we move into this word. Heavenly Father, as we have heard your word read, we invite your Holy Spirit to ultimately be the one to speak to us to interpret your word, to apply your word, to continue to shape us, to make us the people ultimately you've made us and intended us to be. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So when people talk about gifts of the Spirit, this is one of the passages that they commonly refer to. The others you can find in Romans chapter 12 or Ephesians 4 or 1 Peter chapter 4. But as we're thinking about this, what are spiritual gifts? What are these gifts of the Spirit? 
And just a really short definition is that these are the qualities or abilities or gifts that God gives his followers for his purposes. Reality is only the followers of Jesus have spiritual gifts. Now, all people have gifts and talents. Every person is created in the image of God, and because of that, every person exhibits and reflects something of the creativity and the beauty and the character of God himself. But these are spiritual gifts that we're talking about. These are not the normal aptitudes and talents and gifts that God distributes to all. These are specific gifts that God gives to his followers for his specific purposes in the world. And so in the passage that we read today, he lists some of them. He says wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation of tongues. Now, this, this list is just some. Right, that, that actually, this is, it's not an exhaustive list, and there is nowhere in the Bible that there's one exhaustive list of all of the gifts of the Spirit. And so there's some commonalities in them, there's some overlap, but there's also some unique ones that you find in each list. Now, I, I'm not going to try this morning to define them all to you and describe them all to you. I'd encourage you to go and explore that on your own, to dive in more deeply But part of why I'm not going to try to dissect even the ones that are in this passage today is because to do so might miss the point. Because the gifts of the Spirit aren't the point. See, when it comes to the gifts of the Spirit, there is lots of debate even within the church. Are they still present today? Or did they stop working when the apostles died out? Or if they are present, which ones are present? Which ones should we expect? All of them, some of them? And for me, I haven't seen any evidence, certainly in the scripture, that says that they stopped working, that we shouldn't expect all of them to show up in some way. And yet I also am convinced that our expectations around the gifts of the Spirit should be managed and shaped by what the scripture does say. And what the scripture does say is that it's up to God where the gifts are going to show up, who they're going to show up in, when they're going to show up for his very particular purposes. And we can get so wrapped up in the abilities themselves and these remarkable abilities. We can get so focused on, but those gifts are not the real gift. The primary gift is the Holy Spirit himself. The primary gift are not the abilities, but it's the presence of God in you, on you, around you, and through you. This is the Holy Spirit with you. It's just like those birthday gifts with Pama growing up. The sushi and the bowling was not the present. It was the relationship with her, the time being able to be spent with her. And so in the same way, it's the relationship with God. The enjoyment of being in a relationship with the one who delights in you, who cares for you, who comforts you, who guides you. The delight of being with someone you trust, no matter what's happening. When things are good, when things are bad, when there's success or there's failure, there's triumph, there's devastation, there's celebration, there's despair. The gift is God's never-ending, never-failing presence of His Spirit in you. And He's with you. And His purpose, the Holy Spirit's purpose, His primary purpose in you, is not actually to give you abilities to do stuff for God. His primary purpose is to point you to Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit always points to Jesus. This is the the way of things. The Father sends the Son, and the Son points to the Father. The Father and the Son send the Spirit, and the Spirit points to the Son who points to the Father. Their role is always pointing you back to the relationship with God. And so the Holy Spirit's primary role as the gift with you is to point you back to Jesus. This is why Paul starts our whole passage today talking about and saying no one can say Jesus be cursed if they have the Holy Spirit with them. And no one can say and really mean that Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit's at work in them. See, Paul was concerned for the Corinthians and I think for us about idols. Now, when I say idols, you probably might just start to think of little statues and, you know, golden calves and, and things like that. But they were so much more than that because those little things represented for the people their gods. Right? These were the things that they were trusting, looking to, to make life work out, to give life its fullness and its richness. 
They would look to these idols for meaning and security and purpose and hope and joy and protection and provision. Whatever it is that they longed for, they were looking to these idols to meet these particular needs. And we have the same. That, these, that we have idols in our lives. We just may not often think of them that way. Because these idols start to function in a way that sometimes is unnoticed. But even after you come into the church, just like the Corinthians, those habits die hard. Because <laughs> we start looking, what is it that's going to really make life okay? What's going to make it really work out? What's going to give it its fullest meaning for me? And so maybe it's a, a, a particular relationship or a promotion or some sort of status. For me, I know that when I came to faith, I I had built so much of my identity and my worth and my value on what I could achieve in the world. And I could show people, hey, look how good I am and important I am. You should really respect me. And when I came to faith, that was something I had to unlearn over and over and over. That No, it's not about my achievement that gives me value and worth. It's about God's achievement for me. So we can look to health or sex or power or beauty or money or all these things as this is what ultimately is going to give life meaning. And we'll serve those things, whatever it is. Matter of fact, we'll, we'll start to sacrifice other things in our lives in order to try to get that thing. You know, why do we work too much in America? Why is workaholism so common, so prevalent? It's because there's an idol there in most cases. It's because we have this belief that if we work hard, we can achieve something that will give life its meaning. We can get to this place of status or power. We can get this wealth or this security or this money. We can get this thing, and finally life is going to work out. Why is it that people, when they get into a relationship with someone, often abandon their other friends? It's because they put their stock in this relationship as the thing that's going to make their life satisfying, and so they'll throw everybody else out. Why is it that people who often are people of incredible integrity will just flex that integrity a little bit if it means they can get a little bit ahead? It's because somewhere in there, there is an idol at work within us. And the problem with these idols is that they're relentless, When we serve them, they are relentless because they never stop. We keep having to go after them, and they are all temporary. Like, you might get comfort for a moment in your life, but who knows what's going to come with your health next. You might get control over one situation, and that was probably an illusion anyway because another thing comes up, and you realize how little control you have. You can get a promotion one day and the economy can tank and you can lose your job the next. You can have the most amazing relationship with someone even for years and years and years, but eventually even death will separate you. And if that's the thing that's going to make life have its meaning, you're going to be devastated when it's gone. See, this is why Paul doesn't start with the spiritual gifts, these abilities, because he knows that our temptation will be to use these abilities to serve our idols that we'll use these abilities in life to promote whatever it is that we're holding more dear than God himself, to grasp at those things, or maybe just to make ourselves feel good. I think the Corinthians likely saw the gifts as an end in and of themselves, and they had like this hierarchy of which gifts were the better gifts to have or the more important ones, and it was like, if you had these ones, then, man, you were really spiritual. You know, these ones, not so much. And so those who had the good ones, it was like, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty great. But it was all an illusion. And, and Paul is constantly reminding them and us that the primary role of the Holy Spirit is not the abilities, but is to point you back to Jesus, to bring you with humility, to recognize that you in your sinfulness are in need of a Savior, that you can't attain the things in life that you think are going to give you the most satisfaction and meaning. That you will never be good enough to be able to tell yourself, to be able to tell the world, to be able to tell God without a shadow of a doubt, yes, I am great and acceptable and lovable. But the nice thing is that Jesus is not a Lord, Paul says, that demands your sacrifice to be good enough, but instead he is the Lord that sacrificed himself to make you good enough. 
So that's the gift, the Holy Spirit constantly reminding us, calling out the idols in our lives, saying, hey, it's not working for you, and inviting us to turn back, to repent, to turn toward the Lord, who ultimately is the one who can satisfy our need. And only then, when we're reminded of the gospel, of God's lordship, humbled before him, but also reminded how loved we are, that God delights in you through Jesus Christ, does he turn toward what we typically call the gifts of the Spirit. He actually, in this passage, calls them the manifestations of the Spirit, as opposed to gifts, right? Rather than calling these gifts, because gifts are something that, like, we possess and we decide what to do with. Manifestations are something, really, that's kind of happening in us. Manifestations are like an outward, visible, kind of uh, uh, visible sign that proves there's something else going on. Just think about this. If, when you get sick, you, know, you have a virus or an infection inside of you, that you don't necessarily know that immediately, do you? You only actually start to know that you're sick, and it only becomes a problem when the symptoms start to show. You get a fever. You get a rash, you get body aches, you get some other outward visible sign that shows there's something else present within your body. There's some sort of germ, there's some sort of disease that needs to be addressed. And so manifestations of the Spirit are an outward visible reality pointing to the Holy Spirit's presence in you. It's showing, it's actually intended, these gifts are intended to show the world more of who God is. It's less about us. It's not about building us up, but it's about demonstrating to the world who he is, making him known. Which is probably why he decides who gets the gifts and when. Because if we got to decide, we got to look through the gifts and say, you know what, hmm, I really like healing because that one's really cool. That compassion and serving thing, man, that just sounds yucky, right? Like we just choose the ones that will make us feel great and powerful and strong or, or that it'll just be more comfortable or more convenient if it's about us. Because it's about him, he gives the gift in the moment that is appropriate for the moment. And it's his decision. And he's going to give it to whomever and whenever he wants. Which means actually your spiritual gifts can come and go. You might have some for a very long period of time. They extend throughout most of your life. They may come for a short period of time. It may be because one day along in one encounter with some person, the Holy Spirit wanted to do something in their life and may give you the gift in the moment. And then it may go away. Which is why these manifestations of the Spirit, His presence in you, it's why it's so important to regularly reflect on what is the gift that you have given, entrusted to me now. What are, you, what are you wanting to show today? So even if you have already done this exploration and you're like, man, this is just old news and, and you know, you've already checked out, I just want to invite you to come back. You know, to consider again the gifts that God may want to use in you and through you because they weren't yours in the first place. They were just on loan as the Holy Spirit's presence in you. And I've heard lots of other people say, well, I don't really have any gifts. I don't, I don't really have anything to offer. I'm... I'm not really that talented, I'm not really that spiritual, I'm not a good talker, and here's the good news. It's not about you, right? It's not about you. And, and when we think that way, when we start thinking, oh, I don't have anything to offer, it's because we're trusting that it's up to us to have the gifts to be able to then use. We're really showing that we're trusting in ourselves more than we're trusting in God to give us the gift of his Holy Spirit. We're saying it's up to me to do this rather than God. And if we don't, we don't have, feel like we have anything to give, then we're you know, feeling this inadequacy. And if we do have something we feel like we have to give, then we can feel arrogant and self-righteous and look down on everybody else. But the reality is Paul is telling us, and Peter reinforces it in 1 Peter 4, that because it's not about you, you can trust and everyone who's a follower of Jesus can trust that you have at least one gift. And it comes from him. So how do you discover it? How do you actually determine, okay, what gift do I even have at this point? The first is to pray. Right? If this is a manifestation of the Spirit's presence in you, talk to him about it. Right? He, he knows. He's the one that gives it. So ask him. Ask him to show you. Ask him to reveal it. 
There are tools that you can use. There's surveys and inventories and assessments that you can take. Some are available online, and you can go check those out. And those are, those are helpful to a degree, to a point. Right? Because discovering your, your spiritual gifts is not a scientific process. And so you, know, you, you could take a 35-question survey, and it pops out and says, here are your gifts at the end. Now, I'm going to say it's helpful, but it's not exact. Just because the survey says it doesn't mean it's true but it can be so helpful as a starting place. Like you might just be overwhelmed by the whole idea of spiritual gifts and you're like, I have no idea what to do with any of this stuff. Well, you can start there and you can begin to ask, okay, Holy Spirit, are these, okay, are these the gifts that you've given me at this point? Is this the gift? And, and then a be- it can help you confirm or actually a better confirmation is to talk with others about your gifts, particularly those who really know you, know you well. You know, it might be the people that you're sharing a small group with. It might be the people that you're sharing a home with. But those people that you know well, that you can have an honest conversation. You know, maybe you bring the, the results of a survey and you, you try them out. And you say, hey, do you see these gifts in me? And, you know, and if you ask them, hey, do, do you think that I have the gift of wisdom? And if they laugh in your face, the answer is probably no. <laughs> Either that or they don't have the gift of discernment. So... <laughs> I don't know, you're going to have to work that out betwe- between you and see who, who's right and who's not, but <laughs> it's just so helpful to talk with other people because sometimes we can't see ourselves as clearly as other, can, other people can. We can deceive ourselves, and because we're in this journey of faith together, we can, we can build each other up, we can hold each other accountable, we can speak the truth in love and say, yeah, you don't have that gift, but here's what I do see, and we can affirm each other. We can say, yes, because you are in Christ, you have a gift that he wants to give you and to use. And the last thing is to, to try them out, right? You've got, you got to try to use them. You've got to put them into practice. You've got to put yourself in a situation where you can actually see the gift come out. Because if you have the gift of healing, then you're going to have to put yourself in a place where that gift could actually be on display, And I think this is by design that he wants us to put it into practice because that means we have to live by faith. We have to go into places and situations where we can't necessarily control the outcomes. We don't know how it's going to work out. We kind of have to go like, hey, I'm stepping into this and Holy Spirit, if you don't show up, man, this could be a total flop. And that's exactly where he wants us to be because we're dependent. We're connected. We're in relationship with him at that point. We're talking with him. We're living with him. And that's what this, this is an adventure then when you're living each moment, trying this out. And that's what these go and serve together groups are. It's a big adventure to put ourselves out there and say, Holy Spirit, show up. Because this is the reason that then these manifestations of the Spirit are given to us anyway, is that we can go and serve. Paul says that the gifts are given for the common good, not for us. It's not for you, not for me, it's, but it's for the world that, that we would go and serve. And every gift that God gives by His Spirit is a response to the brokenness that's been caused by sin in the world. Every gift that you would have is a response. Right? Like, if, just think about this. If somebody has a broken heart, they don't really need somebody with the gift of preaching to come and start yakking at them, do they? No, they need somebody who's going to come alongside them and quietly and compassionately listen to them and hold them. If somebody's hungry and naked, they don't need someone with the gift of prophecy to come and utter words of truth, calling them to faithfulness and telling them of the great mysteries of what God's going to do in the future. And they need somebody with the gift of hospitality or the gift of service who's going to meet them in their tangible need of desperation in the moment. If someone's perpetuating a a self-destructive lifestyle, they don't need someone with the gift of mercy to come and, uh, and say, oh, they're there, it's going to be okay. They need someone who's going to come with a word of truth and say, hey, this isn't working, pull your head out, and God loves you. Each of the gifts, these manifestations of the Spirit, is a gift in response to the brokenness in the world. So don't downplay the gift that you have because your gift that the the Spirit wants to manifest in you is exactly what someone else needs. And it's up to us just to get into the flow of where Holy Spirit is working and leading us so that we can offer the gift and serve where the need is. And as we serve, man, and as we go, we enjoy the presence 
of God, his Holy Spirit in us, delighting in him, honoring him, and experiencing his delight in us because that primary gift is simply his presence in us and through us. Chariots of Fire is, is a movie that is now very old, but man, it's an incredible movie, an incredible story. It's a true story of, of these British runners in the 1924 Olympics. One is named Eric Little, and he's a really devout Christian man. And he also happens to be one of the fastest runners in the world. And his family works in the mission field in China, and his sister Jenny is trying to convince Eric to give up all this running stuff and join the family on the mission field. She thinks that he's put his running ahead of his commitment to God. And so Eric tries over and over again to get her to understand his perspective. And finally, he says to her, okay, I've decided. I decided I'm going back to China. And he tries to continue to explain the missionary service is accepted, and and he can't even get it out. His sister jumps in and interrupts, oh, Eric, I'm so pleased. But Eric continues. He says, but I've got a lot of running to do. Jenny, you've got to understand, I believe God made me for a purpose for China. He also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give it up would be to hold him in contempt. You were right. It's not just fun. To win is to honor him. I know this this story isn't necessarily about spiritual gifts, but it is about what God has given. And as we use, put into practice what he has entrusted to us, we experience the delight and the pleasure of the God who gave you the gift in the first place and by his spirit is present with you. And so we go into the world to serve, to delight in him, to to enjoy his delight in us. So I want to encourage you, discover first the Holy Spirit as his presence in you, as you trust in the Lord Jesus, and then explore the gifts, the manifestations that he may have entrusted to you because he's entrusted to you to take them out into this world to bring healing and hope where there is darkness and despair and there is brokenness. You have at least one manifestation of the Spirit to give. Will you offer it back to Him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You so much that we don't have to come up with gifts. We don't have to manufacture satisfaction and meaning and purpose and joy and security, but that You give all this as profound gift from You, accomplished by our Lord Jesus Christ, His sacrifice, to show us how loved we are, to show us your delight so that we can turn away from the idols and turn back to you. Lord, may we experience your pleasure and delight as we know more and more your Holy Spirit in us. May you give us the eyes to see and understand the manifestations of your Spirit that you want to to show through us and show us the ways and the places where we can move toward those who are hurting and broken and we can offer the hope that comes as a response, your gift to them through us. Or may we go and serve as you have served us. In Jesus' name, amen.